Hello everybody and welcome back. The River Trent has always been one of my favourite places to be and I've fished on that river so many times with my dad who was a very keen angler when I was younger. Before I could fish, I would play in the woods and fields around there quite happily all day until the sunset whilst my dad fished from dawn till dusk. Now there's a place not too far from the race course at Nottingham called Colwick Country Park and it's one of the places I played and I didn't know that's what it was called back then and little did I know that it was also a place known for paranormal apparitions and the Lady of the Lake who's also seen as a fleeting white figure who roams by the body of water next to Colwick Hall. Now, over the decades, a number of strange events and encounters have happened in this area, with rumours of coursing couples using the lanes being scared off by a strange invisible foe. So when another one came in, it didn't shock me. It happened quite close to our Nottingham werewolf account and all manner of strange events that get reported in the Colwick area. Now, the witness account came in through the website and the person said, I saw a totally flat, one-dimensional image of a very bulky figure with big shoulders and a tiny head walking along with long, swinging arms. Now, this figure was goose-stepping rapidly across the trees on the opposite bank. It crossed from left to right, appearing only briefly enough for me to be certain that it was there. It was similar in shape to someone wearing a very heavily padded black coat with the hood up. It had a tiny little triangular head set between basketball-sized shoulders. But there seemed no restriction on its movement at all. Those old big arms were swinging all the way up and down with no trouble. It looked almost robotic, but there was also something strikingly apish in its profile. I was looking right at it as it dashed in and out of sight in one, two, three steps and then was gone. Do you want to know what it looked like? Do you remember playing Super Mario Brothers or Sonic on a Game Boy in the 90s? That's what it looked like, like a cartoon. It wasn't on the walk path, which I could also see clearly. Whatever it was, it was moving through the trees. Now it would seem that whatever this witness saw, it was one-dimensional in origin, and also impossible to explain or draw, leaving the witness with an impossible task of describing the figure they saw that day. Now let's have a look at some of the other strange experiences that happened in the very same area. I chose sightings that have been reported within a five-mile radius of Colwick Hall. Now, I received a report from a fellow Bartian who did a number of investigations in the 70s all the way up through the decades until now, and he still is working online researching. Now, he shared the following account with me a number of years ago now, and it happened when he was out doing a field investigation in the 70s. And he said the weather conditions that night were cold, there was no moonlight, but there was a slight southerly breeze and intermittent rain showers. They had two walkie-talkies with them and one large tape recorder and several torches. There was a gentleman called John H, John C, Pete J, Graham M, Ron G, Sid H and the gentleman who reported this to me. Now the time was approximately 12.30am to around 12.45am. Now, one of our team members, John H., was alerted by the public that dog walkers and canoodling couples were being disturbed by something roaming the heights at night. Couples or people on the lanes were reporting strange encounters and John wanted to do a night investigation there to see if anything untoward happened. A short time later, on a Saturday night, along with several stalwart paranormal investigators, We set off for the area in a Dormer mobile van, arriving there at approximately 11pm. We parked halfway down the lane on a short grass field and we parked facing the way we had come in. There are two small woods, one on each side of the field, and the one on our left contained a small quarry. 
We patrol the area in pairs, carrying one walkie-talkie and a torture piece. We walk down the side of each wood as well as the field area itself. And eventually it began to rain, so we set off back to the van for a well-earned cup of tea. The rain pitted pattered on the van's metal roof. We sat comfortably inside the van, the three sat either side facing each other, and the driver in his seat. It was while we were discussing something that the driver shouted for quietness. Now the rest of us could hear nothing but the rain falling on the van's roof. Listen, he insisted, and we did. And that's when we first heard a faint but heavy breathing sound slowly approaching towards the right side of the van. We sat upright, warily, as we listened to the slowly approaching sound. Passing by the outside of the van, the deep, heavy breathing sound blotted out the rain noise. The breathing sound was that loud, it drove out the noises of the night and the rain constantly dripping on the van roof. Reaching the two back doors, the extremely loud breathing noise lowered in height down to the level of the foot square windows and stayed there. The back door windows were approximately a foot from the top of the doors themselves and something was staring through one of the windows at us and we couldn't see a thing at that window, not a sign of anything standing there. But the heavy stentorian breathing continued unabated all the time. Now Ron G was sitting next to me and he was nearest the back door on his right. He shakily raised his left arm in the air, clutching a very heavy foot-long rubber encased torch, and he was holding it like a club. Well, something was better than nothing, I suppose, even against an eight-foot something or other, as we guesstimated its height by the height of the van roof, before it lowered downward slowly to peer into the window. And that's exactly what it sounded like, as if something around eight feet in height, was watching us through the window of the van, breathing heavily the whole time. This went on for an eternity or so, and it seemed, as the long seconds passed by, that it wasn't going to stop. Listening to that loud, heavy breathing sound, our eyes fastened on the door handles in case they began to be pressed downwards, but the two doors would fly open. No, thank you. I think we all gave a sigh of relief as the breathing sound slowly, eventually, rose up to its full height once more, and then turning, began to walk away slowly, in the direction of the wooded quarry. We all sat dumbstruck and silent for a while. It wasn't till the heavy breathing was about half in volume of what it had been at the back doors of the van, that we suddenly sprang into action springing out of the van and dashing through the now open back doors. In our torchlights, the wet grass at the back of the doors didn't appear to be more compressed than the surrounding rain-soaked grass. Yet something had stood at those doors for quite a while. We then immediately shone our combined torch beams in the direction of the slowly receding, heavy breathing sound, which we could hear plainly. But nothing was visible as it continued to slowly amble away in the direction of the small, small wood with the quarry in it. Back inside the van, we discussed the strange situation for a few brief minutes. Then, with the van's engine roaring thankfully to life, we left the field and the night behind us, until it happened again. It was around two years later, when I'd been asked several times over the course of a fortnight to visit the Althorpe Crossroads area, and specifically the last field on the right, at the end of the lane, at around 12 p.m. midnight, uh, 12 a.m. sorry, midnight. I decided to go there, being the inquisitive character I am, and I phoned Pete, a Nottingham fellow investigator, to see if he would join me on the little expedition. Unfortunately, there was no reply to my call, but I was now determined to go come hell or high water. The weather conditions were light wind and intermittent bright sunlight, with numerous small clouds floating slowly towards the east. I arrived there at 11pm, 
and there was a small herd of approximately a dozen horses were gathered at the then metal gate entrance to their large field, curious heads overhanging the top of the gate. After around 20 minutes of forehead and muzzle stroking, we were the best of friends, always peaceful and quiet. Our tall, thick hedge separated the horse's field and the one next to it, which I was about to enter. There was no gated entrance to this field then, just an open, wide gap. Entering the field, I walked by the side of the wide, tall hedge, which separated it from the country lane on its left and towards the crossroads on the Foss Way, which again was separated from the large field by another wide, tall hedge. I gave myself two hours and then I'd be away. The time passed slowly. Even in the best of moonlight, I could hardly see the opposite end of the field that I was standing in. Several cigarettes later, and the time was approximately 12.30am, and it was then I heard what I thought was a faint snuffling sound coming from the lane behind me. Just a hedgehog or a stoat searching for its insect supper in the hedge bottom, I concluded satisfactorily to myself. However, the sound continued to slowly increase in volume, as whatever was making it was slowly approaching down the lane side of the hedge behind me. It wasn't till a dozen or so long seconds later that I finally recognised the noise. didn't sound like snuffling now, but increasingly loud breathing as it slowly approached. It was identical to the deep, heavy breathing I'd heard at Colwick Heights, the invisible breather incident from two years earlier. My senses were now fully alert. As it passed me by on the other side of the lane's hedge, the deep, heavy, noisy breathing sound was once more overwhelming, as it had been as it stood at the back of the motor van when we were on the heights. But this time, there was no van to shelter in and no other investigators on site. My reflexes and mine were in a turmoil of whether to stay or flee. But I was inwardly angry at all the paranormal activity my family and myself had witnessed and suffered since 1968, with no answers ever being given as to why. So I determined to stay and hold my ground, but not without forming a quick escape plan. If whatever it was seemed aggressive, if it seemed as it came moving slowly towards me, if things didn't look too well, I decided I would race across the field and take the long road home down the ancient narrow track at its far end. I based my perhaps escape plan on the invisible breather being a slow walker. I stood quietly, my cigarette cups in my hand to show no light, as I heard the invisible breather slowly making its way down the narrow lane towards the field's open entrance. The breathing noise getting less loud. Come on, it's either revelation time or not, I thought desperately to myself. And as the moonlight dimmed and brightened at times, and as the small clouds passed overhead, I decided to look. It was when the breathing noise was half as loud as it had been when it passed me by that I heard the horses playing up. They began neighing and snorting and stamping the ground heavily with their hooves. After a dozen long seconds or so, I heard them, heard them turn as one and race pell-mell into the distance across the field, snorting and neighing loudly, their hooves thudding. And as I went, my resolve to stay vanished in that instant. Now if we go all the way to, still in Nottingham, still in the same area, but many, many years later, in 2015, there was a family out, and it was 1am, and the gentleman reported, I was driving home, going along the Althorpe Road, from a Christmas party, and I was heading towards the A46. It happened on the 27th of December 2015. I was approaching a corner, the one just before the Eaton Park nursing home, when the headlights of my car highlighted something stood in a lay-by. It was about six foot tall and covered in reddish-brown hair all over. My family saw it as they were with me in the car at the time. It had dark eyes and a human face. I don't want any help or anything, 
but I felt like I should share with you what we saw in case there was a large cat on the loose or something. This is the only thing I've, I can think of to explain it. My son says it was a monster. If we listen to the description again, he says, It was about six foot tall and covered in reddish brown hair all over. So that would either be a cat stood on two legs and reaching about six foot tall. And it had dark eyes and a human face. Now, I know people say I jump to conclusions, but that doesn't sound very cat-like to me. Um, and as I say, not too far away, within five miles again, in 1994... Um, we had another account, and it wasn't too long ago, I was contacted by a gentleman, and he said, I wanted to contact you, Deborah, as I've carried this with me for decades, and whenever I've tried to share it, I'm never believed. It happened close to the Harvey Haddon Stadium in Bilborough, Nottingham, and the area's changed a lot over the years, as it's been built on now. But at that time, in 94, it was all open fields, and it was a nice place to be. Well, it all happened about 24 years ago now, and I live in Nottingham, and I'm a very open-minded person back then. And I was going out with a girl, and I always walked her home at night, going the same way every time. We'd walk through a path, and then we always walked down a long cut through. We did the same walk every time, and we never had any problems, until one night. I'd walked her home, and I was returning to my home for the night. I'm not the sort of person who scares easily. But this changed my perspective on things after it happened, and I've never been able to forget it. I was going through the cut-through, just minding my business, when I heard a blood-curdling growl. I just froze. I was so scared. Then I turned around, and I couldn't believe what I saw. This thing that I was looking at was about seven foot tall, with a heavy build and black fur all over its body. Now, I'm six foot eight, and I am scared of no man. But this thing scared the living hell out of me. I started to back up bit by bit, and it just stood there and looked at me. Then it started to come towards me, and I ran like mad. I don't think I have ever run that fast in my life before. I knew it was behind me all the way. I could hear it breathing and running. How I managed to get home, I will never know. But somehow I did. I came flying through the front door and I was as white as a ghost. And my dad asked me, what's happened? And then I told him and he said, oh, it's the dark playing tricks on your eyes. Now, after about a week or so of him keep saying that, I thought it was right. So I just left it at that. I was so wrong, though. As a year or so later, I was walking over the same place with my girlfriend's brother. And it was a foggy night, and we were just walking along, and then just out of the blue he said, What's that? I can't see anything. And I said, What are you on about? And then he pointed at this crouch thing, and I literally could not believe my eyes. It was moving through the fog swiftly, and then it stopped. And that's when I heard that growl again, and we both set off running. We ran like mad. I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it, and I'd convinced myself it was the darkness playing tricks, but not the second time. How do I explain that away? Who can explain it to me, as it feels like no one can? I believe what I saw ever since that night, and I've never walked that way again. And we never talk about it. So that I never talked to the lad I was with, not even when I see him now. And I still think about those nights to this day, Deborah. It still scares me that much. I'm not nuts, and I know no one will believe me, but I saw a werewolf, and I will go under a lie detector test if you can arrange it to prove that I'm not lying. The creature that I saw was crouched over on all fours, and it was still huge, at least five feet high, and if it had been stuck to its full height, I think it would be about seven foot tall. It was very broad across the chest, the width was bigger than mine, and I have a 50-inch chest. It was massive and all black in colour, with longish arms, and it was very dark and hair-covered, but I'm sure it had a dog's head. I do remember its eyes. I will never forget them, or the colour as they were yellow. 
To be honest, I was so terrified. I don't think I will ever forget that night. And it would seem to me whatever is moving around the Old Fort Road area has been doing so for a number of decades now. And these are just the reports that we know of. I wonder if there is anyone out there who's experienced something close to Colwick Hall or along the Althorpe Road who thinks that they're the only one to experience anything there. The witnesses mentioned here don't know each other. They've never communicated at any point. Yet all the experience happened very close to each other, close to the Althorpe Road and the surrounding woods and quarry, and they all happened within the last 40 years. So if you know of anyone from that area who's experienced anything, or you're that person yourself, get in touch with me. Leave a comment in the section below, or contact me at the website. Just put my name into Google and I'll pop up somewhere. Or you can email me at debbiehatswell at gmail.com, all lowercase. So enjoy your weekend, and until next time, good night. <laughs>